Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to ACSM's Professional Development Webinar Series. My name is Katie Feltman, and I work for ACSM, and today's webinar will be on navigating the world of predatory publishing. I just wanted to cover a few housekeeping items before we get started. The first is, if you have a question during the webinar, please type it into the question area on your screen, and we'll try to get to as many of the questions as we can at the end. I'd also like to thank today's sponsor, Forrest T. Jones. If you are an ACSM member, you qualify for exclusive member discounts through FTJ. Be sure to check out the ACSM website member benefits page for more information. I know this is a really interesting topic, so if you'd like to join and continue the conversation about today's webinar on Twitter after um, the webinar has ended, we encourage you to do so by using the hashtag ACSMWebinar. I'd now like to introduce today's presenters. We're so very fortunate and grateful to have Dr. Bruce Gladden and Dr. Jeffrey Pottinger helping us out. Dr. Gladden is the Editor-in-Chief of Medicine and Science in Sports and Exercise, which is ACSM's flagship journal. And Dr. Pottinger is the Chair of the ACSM Publications Committee. With that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Dr. Pottinger? Thank you, Katie. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to the webinar today. This is a particularly timely topic. Um, Bruce and I were just chatting a little bit before the webinar started, and each of us earlier today received invitations to participate as editorial members uh, on a journal, uh, two different journals that um, uh, I was unfamiliar with mine, and, I, and I, I'll let Bruce speak for himself, but I think he had indicated he was unfamiliar with his as well. And we got invitations to, um, to also submit papers uh, to, to these journals. Uh, the one that invited me, I had, I had never heard of before. So I found it interesting and, and timely uh, that that would happen just a few moments ago. If we take a look at the slide that's on your screen now, and we try to put the concept or the topic of predatory publishing into context, for many of the individuals that are involved in the academic world, publishing research and scholarly activity is really very important to the success of the individual uh, as a faculty member, as a researcher, uh, as a professional. And this is not necessarily just limited to the academic world. Uh, if we use healthcare as an example, what we find is that many individuals who work in hospitals, uh, many individuals who uh, provide health services to um, uh, both healthy and uh, injured and diseased individuals uh, need to disseminate the information that they find that is important for um, training individuals or uh, providing uh, care, whether it be acute or chronic care to individuals who are sick or injured, and therefore improving the outcome measures, uh, whether it be uh, an improvement in performance, uh, whether it be a reduction of disease risk, whether it be um, a better response to a treatment. So, I don't want anyone to think that we're only talking about the academic environment, and this only only is relevant to those individuals who work at colleges and universities. I think it has a much broader reach um, uh, as a particular area of interest. You can see the information that's provided on the slide um, just last year, and that's the year that we have the most recent data. There are about 30,000 academic journals that are out there, and depending upon the criteria you use to identify what is considered a predatory journal, there are approximately a third of those journals considered predatory journals. Now, those of us in either academia or in any professional um, uh, work environment know that it has been a challenge to get good research, to get good scholarship published in a good quality journal. Um, it's becoming increasingly difficult to do this because there are more researchers, there are more individuals that are interested in disseminating their information to the broader audience. And in fact, we now know that uh, trying to get into a journal to publish your information 
is harder than it ever has been before. And as a result of that, what we've seen is a rise of journals that offer services to publish information. Now, because a journal is new, because a journal has the ability to uh, publish information, uh, whether it be opinion pieces or whether it be um, you know, acute research or whether it be a clinical trial, it's not necessarily a predatory journal, but we have seen a number of these journals arise over the last several years. And therefore, what's important for us to do is make sure that we understand the, the characteristics that make a journal predatory. So on the slide on your screen now, we've listed a number of things that um, we've identified as sort of attributes uh, that would make a journal predatory. And probably the key issue is that most of, or, or almost all of these journals are in fact open access journals and they require a fee for publication in the journal. And that's how they generate their income. Now, being open access does not make a journal predatory. Requiring a fee for publishing an open access article does not make a journal uh, predatory. It's just one characteristic that should be considered when trying to identify uh, a journal that um, uh, might be considered predatory. Other factors that I think are at play here is that with a lot of the journals, the established publishing world has identified quality of the papers uh, that are published uh, of a concern, quality of the review process. And Bruce is gonna talk a little bit more about the, the idea of protecting science. But what we see in a lot of these predatory journals is that in fact, there is no editing performed and there is no or a very questionable peer review process. And peer review is paramount to making sure that the uh, information that's published, uh, the science, uh, the research, the scholarship is in fact of high quality and should be um, viewed upon as something that is um, uh, good to use and uh, something that can be important in training athletes, in treating individuals, in making decisions about um, providing health care. Uh, just some examples. And I don't want uh, the audience to think that we're only talking about predatory journals being involved in healthcare and in training. Um, these journals are out there in uh, a wide range of, of fields and disciplines and uh, professional uh, uh, employment areas. Uh, one of the things we also see is that these, in, these journals tend to engage in very unethical business practices. And what, they, what, that, what we mean by that is that they offer services or they make claims about the journal that are, that are not true. Um, things that are very important in the academic world uh, in terms of evaluating the quality of a journal would be something that's referred to as the impact factor. And the impact factor takes into account uh, how many articles are published in that journal and how many times the articles are cited. And it creates a, a, an index factor that uh, gives you some, in, some indication of the quality of the journal. And then also indexing. Indexing indicates that the journal has been around uh, for a specific period of time. It has published a certain number of uh, journal articles uh, during that time. And it is an indicator of a reputable journal that is good for which individuals can publish their information in. Uh, we also see, and as I mentioned earlier, some very aggressive solicitation of manuscripts and questionable marketing tactics. Uh, as Bruce and I were preparing previously this week, uh, we, we had talked about how often we receive invitations to either submit our manuscripts uh, to these journals 
or how often we receive invitations to serve on the editorial boards of these journals. And we've come to learn that a lot of these journals will purchase um, uh, a distribution list from an organization's annual meeting. And they might not necessarily purchase it from the organization, but they might get it from uh, vendors who had participated in the uh, the professional conference, and they'll simply send out invitations, uh, making it appear that the invitation comes in conjunction with the professional organization or the professional conference, but when in fact it does not. We're also seeing that journals that are considered predatory will use names that um, provide some confusion. And the example that you see in front of you is that there is, uh, for real, a Journal of Economics and Finance, and then there's also a Journal of Finance and Economics that is probably not um, up to the same standard as the Journal of Economics and Finance. Bruce? Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh... I'm going to jump in here now, and uh, one, one of the things I want to emphasize is that uh, this uh, notion of predatory publishing is really much more than simply uh, people being invited to uh, submit their articles, to pay and have them published without peer review. Uh, that's one of the things we think about right away, as Jeff was describing. We, we, you get a you get an invitation, and they pretty much guarantee you're going to get that uh, article accepted, and it'll be up and online right away. But it's really a lot more than that. Uh, we already mentioned that both of us received um, invitations this morning, not only to submit manuscripts, but to become uh, editorial board members. And so um, you'll see things like uh, the invitation I got when you. When you finally get to their website, uh, they say, uh, we'd be happy for you to be an editorial board member, and uh, you really don't have to do any work. And so uh, the, that, that begins to enter into the, into the equation. And I'll come back to this in a moment, but I, I, think, I think one thing we do have to acknowledge, there's a little bit of a dirty underbelly here, and that is there is a market for this. And one thing I would say right up front is you don't want to be part of that market because uh, I don't think it'll be good for your career or for science in the long run. Uh, another thing we see is, um, you know, invitations to, to uh, be a peer reviewer on, uh, on a journal that is uh, actually a predatory journal. And one of the problems there is that legitimate journals are, uh, as Jeff was saying, there's so many journals these days um, that uh, there's uh, some uh, reviewer fatigue out there. And if you have uh, other illegitimate people inviting uh, folks to review, then you're just getting uh, even more uh, invitations and more likely to turn down uh, a, an actual legitimate invitation. Another thing that's going on is uh, author services, uh, in, uh, invitations to help you get your paper published for a fee. A lot of this goes towards uh, uh, foreign countries. Uh, English is uh, the typical preferred language for the vast majority of high quality journals. So, so there are actual invitations uh, to assist people with language, but this can, this can go out for, for anybody, um, you know, help you with your graphs. Uh, all kinds of things now are being sold and that leads into the next one, which is, um, of course, you can uh, buy your way onto a paper. We have this paper. It's in your field. Here's some data. If you'll contribute a little bit more, uh, you'll be an author on it also. Um, and so um, there are just uh, many, many different aspects to the whole predatory publishing, uh, publishing business. And now the other thing that we see going on uh, in connection with it is uh, – Soliciting abstracts after a meeting, uh, obviously uh, there's uh, access to uh, abstracts that are presented at, at uh, legitimate uh, international and national conferences, and authors of those abstracts are now getting invitations to um, publish those um, um, papers that follow from those abstracts or to publish conference proceedings. And beyond that, there are now invitations to participate in conferences that uh, uh, are not really legitimate conferences, and to um, you, you, you would end up paying uh, to attend the conference uh, and be a speaker. 
And uh, I even read a story in the New York Times where uh, uh, some people actually tracked down one of these conferences, and there were a handful of people in a small room in a hotel. And that was that was the conference that was going on, uh, although it had been advertised as an international conference, and uh, I guess people were paying to uh, to actually attend and be uh, uh, session directors and leaders. Uh, so, uh, what are the consequences if you do end up getting into a predatory journal? Well, there there are a lot of things uh, to you as an individual. I mean. Uh, your work is not protected. Uh, legitimate journals will have a, a copyright protection for you. Uh, and although um, we all complain about peer review, uh, I've often said that uh, a career in science, for example, is a, is a lifetime career of negative reinforcement uh, because you rarely get uh, uh, feedback that says, wow, this was incredible. You're much more often getting feedback that is critical and saying improve this or that. But despite that, um, the peer review process I think, remains the best uh, method that we have for uh, ensuring the quality of, of scientific research. And so if you get into a predatory journal, typically you're going to get either poor or no uh, peer review. Uh, the other thing is that uh, since these uh, journals and websites can come and go, you may have your article appear and then disappear, and, and then, um, you know, a, a, a paper that you've got on your CV and uh, indicating you published uh, this uh, research in this uh, journal uh, now doesn't exist anywhere. Uh, it can furthermore be hard to find um, because it may not be indexed by, say, Web of Science or Scopus or, uh, or uh, PubMed, and so uh, it's not going to be in the mainstream of the uh, people you would like to see it. Uh, and there are, there are numerous ethics ac accusations that can occur, and you can actually end up with real career injury by being in a predatory journal. Uh, once it, your paper is published there, if the journal remains around, if on the opposite extreme, it's hard to get it off. Uh, and uh, then ultimately to get it into a legitimate journal. But I think one of the big things that it really goes beyond the individual level, and that is uh, we really need to talk about the protection of science. Um, so I think one of the worst case scenarios of this uh, continued growth of predatory journals uh, is it, it is really predatory science, and we end up with a compromised quality. Uh, you could conceivably end up with inappropriate treatment of patients or inappropriate training of clients because you're getting uh, information that's not good. And I actually fear that sports science may be more susceptible to this, uh, this uh, use of poor science because, uh, as we all know, there are magazines, there's a lot of interest in exercise uh, for weight control and for gaining muscle mass, et cetera. And uh, if you um, publish uh, these uh, you know, articles that uh, really are not very high quality, haven't undergone peer review, and then those work their way into uh, practice, that's uh, really a degeneration of the whole scientific process. So I think it's not just an individual uh, person thing, it's, it's really all of science that's important. So how do we navigate this? And uh, we have several things here. Uh, this uh, website, Think, Check, Submit, is, is quite good, uh, has excellent questions there. But one of the things I would point out is that you really, really need to rely on your um, colleagues, your mentors, your supervisors, trusted organizations, and, and uh, common sense. Uh, one of the things I always think is if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. So if you are a uh, doctoral student or a beginning, uh, you know, an early postdoctoral fellow or an early assistant professor, and you're being invited to be the editor-in-chief of an uh, international journal, that's probably too good to be true. So uh, I think we all need to use some common sense. But the things you have to think about are, some of them are shown here on this slide. Uh, do you know the journal? Have you ever heard of it? Uh, do your colleagues know about it? Um, are you able to get in contact with the publisher? Uh, is it clear uh, about what the review process will be? Um, and very importantly, are the articles going to be indexed in a, a service you have heard of? Is it going to be on PubMed? Is it going to be in Scopus? Is it going to be in Web of Science? Um, 
are the fees clearly stated? Do you know what you're going to pay and when you're going to pay and what for? And then the big one I think here is, uh, do you recognize people uh, on the editorial board? Do your, does your major professor recognize people on that editorial board? And then the last bullet point there is whether or not the publisher is a uh, member of a recognized industry initiative, such as COPE or the Directory of Open Access Journals. But again, I would emphasize um, greatly that you need to rely on uh, colleagues, other experts, supervisors, mentors, et cetera, in common sense to avoid being uh, uh, taken up in the uh, predatory publishing business. So there are a number of sites that are available to assist you with this process in addition to the uh, advice that Bruce gave you with regard to contacting your mentor or your colleagues, uh, your professional organizations, and you can see that on this slide. So if you look, there is the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association. Uh, Bruce mentioned the directory of open access journals. There's also a website called Cabells that actually maintains a whitelist blacklist, which is another way of saying these are journals that seem to be legitimate and these are journals that people have some questions about. Um, Beal's List uh, was a librarian uh, in Colorado uh, who used to maintain a list of uh, predatory publishers. Uh, another organization has replaced the individual and publishes um, uh, regularly an update to the list. Uh, a lot of people in, in today's day and age uh, like to re refer to Google Scholar, and if it's uh, shown on Google Scholar, that means that it must be a pretty reputable place to disseminate my information. However, remember, that uh, Google Scholar doesn't vet the journals that it indexes. So anybody can get listed on uh, Google Scholar. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a journal that you ought to be publishing your information in. And we talked a little bit about uh, colleagues and uh, asking your advisor, your faculty, uh, uh, colleagues that you work with, your mentor for some help. But probably one of the best places you could go for support is to a librarian. Uh, if you're working at a college or a university, contact that individual. They know their way around the publishing world. And in many instances, larger libraries will actually have individuals that are responsible for uh, keeping up to date on these kinds of uh, journals that are out there looking for um, uh, getting you to sort of buy your way into getting the manuscripts published. Some resources that are available. Um, Bruce talked a little bit about Think, Check, Submit. Uh, COPE is listed there, the Scholarly Kitchen, the Association of Learned and Professional Society Publishers. Um, several of these websites uh, generally have some uh, discussion back and forth uh, about different types of journals. What are the types of things to look for uh, when you're trying to identify uh, a predatory journal or whether you're trying to make a determination of some offer being too good to be true. So I would encourage you, if you have questions, take a look at these resources and um, see if you can get those questions answered um, through, through a couple of clicks. And then finally, we wanted to make sure that um, we uh, gave credit. Katie, can you go to the next slide? There we go. Wanted to make sure we gave credit to our references and sources uh, for today's uh, webinar. And you can see that they're listed here. Um, this is a growing area, and more people are paying attention to it. Um, I will tell you that in preparation for today's webinar, I actually uh, read the article by Bowman uh, in American Journal of Pharmacological Education, and I found it to be highly, highly informative. Um, the, uh, Nature, the Nature article by Chala is very good as well. So if you have a chance and you want to um, expand your knowledge in this area 
of uh, predatory publishing, I think there's some really good resources here for you all to take a look at. So that takes us to the end of our formal presentation today. I know we've received a number of questions already that um, we can probably uh, take a look at and, and start with. Please remember that if you do have a question uh, about uh, information that we've discussed today, you can submit it by typing it into the um, the section on the webinar webinar control box, and we'll get to it as soon as we can. Thanks so much, Dr. Pottinger. So um, one of the questions we've received, which I think maybe um, is a good one to start with because you and Dr. Gladden were discussing it, um, is someone would ask if there are some more or additional examples that you all would like to share of how predatory publishers have contacted you um, to try and get you to submit their work to them or get you involved on the journal. So if there are some other examples that you have that you can sure. provide, I believe sure. that's what I'll, I'll, Yeah, I'll, I'll start and then Bruce, you can chime in. One of the ways that I always find um, it amusing is that I, I'm very familiar with my area of research and scholarly activity. I know what I work on and I get these invitations where um, the text will be something like, um, you know, we saw your recent paper in, and it'll have a phrase, and uh, I haven't published in that area of research at all. Uh, I have no background in that area. Uh, I certainly would, and even if I do, I certainly wouldn't consider myself uh, an expert uh, in that particular area. So that's another example of, of um, ways that I think you can uh, I sort of identify someone, particularly if they're asking you to be on the editorial board. And then also with regard to invitations for publishing your manuscripts, most journals have a pretty narrowly defined um, areas that they, that they sort of want to publish in. There are some in exercise and sports science that are a little bit broader, but but most of them are pretty narrowly defined. And so when you get an invitation to publish in a journal that, that it just doesn't look like your research work fits the scope of that journal from the title of the journal, I think that's also an indicator that it, it might be something to be concerned about. Bruce, I don't know if you had any other examples that you could uh, share with the group yeah, I agree. That that's the kind of thing you see. If you know, if you're an exercise physiologist and you get an invitation to be an editorial board member or write a paper for the uh, Far Eastern Journal of Microelectronics, uh, that's probably not uh, probably not where you should be seeking to publish, and probably a good sign that that uh, that it's a uh, you know a bogus um, um, organization or site. And you see the same things again with the conferences. Uh, it'll be a conference on uh, Know, or sometimes very broad things, you know, global this or that, uh, ecology, climate, and sports or something. <laughs> and they're asking you to be a uh, a session organizer or leader. And so, again, I think we have to rely on on uh, some common sense and, uh, and and again on the websites we've looked at and and your um, colleagues, uh, supervisors, mentors, librarians, uh, and and just. Uh, you know, go through the regular sites. And one thing I would emphasize again is there is a market out there, and I and I hope it's not the market. I hope it's not a market among uh, particularly uh, USA uh, you know, doctoral students and and young professors because uh, it's it's really it's really you know not not it's not really ethical I think to be seeking to uh, publish. Um, completely unreviewed uh, data, even when you think it's really good. Uh, I mean, as much as we dislike uh, the criticism, I think it, it, it most often improves uh, the product. So there's a couple of other questions. Um, several of them are asking if we're, we've recorded this. We have, and we'll make it available, not just to ACSM members, but to the public. Um, another question was asking about, are there sites where um, these journals can be, um, you know, you can look them up. And I think we mentioned um, the blacklist and the whitelist. So you'll be able to come back to this presentation to see those. We have an interesting question here, which is, if one fails to recognize a predatory journal and submits a paper that is accepted and published, what steps can be taken to pull or rectify this? 
Um, Bruce, do you want to address that question as editor in chief? I, I don't know if I know the answer. You're, you, you, <laughs> that's why you're going to have to you're going to have to try to contact them. And I can tell you that sometimes um, uh, we've had issues with with uh, medicine, science, sports, and exercise. We've had we've had instances of plagiarism. We actually had a couple of cases where an entire article is just copied and published in one of these uh, bogus journals. And when you try to contact them, you don't get an answer. And so that comes back to one of the slides we had earlier that, that uh, you know, make every attempt not to be caught up in it. Uh, if you are, then you try to contact them, try to remove it, try to withdraw it. And uh, um, beyond that, uh, sometimes, uh, you, you, unfortunately, you just don't even have the ability to, to make contact with, with the people you're trying to rectify the situation with. So I don't have a good answer for that. Yeah, um, I, well, I, I would I would agree with what uh, Bruce stated. It's going to be very difficult in many instances to get your information withdrawn. Uh, and then, of course, you run the risk of if it's if it's published out there somewhere and you realize that a mistake has been made and you want to publish it in a in a reputable journal, you may not be allowed to do that. You, you may get uh, the editor in chief of that journal saying, you know, no, it's it's published on this journal's website. And even if it is a predatory journal with a little to no oversight, little to no peer review, you really you really are are sort of out of luck, so to speak, in trying to get that published in. Uh, a journal that maybe has a higher impact factor or a journal that maybe is more consistent with what the expectations are from uh, others that work in your in your discipline or your profession. Right, which yeah. is why we've tried to focus on preventative measures um, because it is very difficult. And one of the other pieces of information we read is that it's, um, you know, when institutions are making hiring decisions, they've they are now check, checking these blacklists and whitelists, and if they see that an individual has published a paper on one of these, they're actually looking for that information. Um, so I think it's difficult. We have another interesting question, which I think Bruce, maybe um, Dr. Gladden spoke to earlier about the supply and demand, which is, this is more philosophical, um, and this will have to be our last question. It's so interesting. I think we'd love to do this for the next hour, but um, the question is, how do we deal with the rising generation of young scholars who have always had an immediate outlet for their opinions via social media and have never had to earn the right to be heard. Don't you think to some degree this is driving the dark industry? Well, <laughs> I, I fear that may be correct. Uh, so uh, one of the things I've seen is this this is a job uh, for, um, for all of us that are at institutions, it's a job of the institution. I'm talking about universities and, and, and places of training here. That uh, it's, it's incumbent on all of us to emphasize the importance, again, to science. Uh, science is built upon a discovery that is then checked and rechecked and checked again for uh, whether or not it's accurate or correct. And if you simply bypass all of that, uh, then, then you're, you're going to not have any uh, good information ultimately, or you're going to undermine good information. So I think it's it's very important to be training uh, this uh, in every new generation in in the uh, correct practice of science, uh, and because I, the point is is correct, uh, th there is a market out there uh, for this, and uh, that's why we're getting solicited is because uh, some people are actually uh, uh, signing on to this and paying the money, and, that, and, and so we have to uh, be vigilant in terms of training individuals to know that um, the correct way to approach science is to seek peer review, to publish in the in the right locations, and to um, to maintain um, you know high quality. Thanks so much, um, Dr. Gladden. So I think um, at this point we need to wind the webinar down and end it. Um, what I will note for everybody listening is that um, Dr. Gladden and Dr. Potiger were invited to follow this webinar up with an article in ACSM Sports Medicine Bulletin. And so we'll save all of the additional questions that were asked and I will pass those along and perhaps those can be addressed um, in what they write. So. I just want to thank everybody for joining us. I want to thank Dr. Gladden and Dr. Potiger for their input. 
Um, and on behalf of ACSM and our sponsor, Forrest P. Jones, we thank you all for attending. Um, this concludes the webinar. Thank you, Katie. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.